Okay, we ready to get started? Um, it's top of the hour. So welcome everyone. Uh, this week we have the we we've combined uh, sunflowers and pulse crops, so it's the joint sessions all week long. Um, we've had a, a slight change of of schedule. Um, for the Wednesday and Thursday session. So we'll be flipping those tomorrow. We'll be joined by uh, Brent Reck from Purist. So we'll be talking about some of the his their perspective on, on the pulse industry in South Dakota. And then we'll have diseases on, on Thursday. Um, but today uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about uh, joined by the entomology team. Um, and they're going to be covering, I think, a pretty wide range of, of topics. Um, and first is Dr. Adam Varenhorst, who is our entomologist on campus. And I'm going to just go ahead and turn it over to you, Adam, and let you introduce your topic and, and get going. All right. Thanks, Chris. So just to make sure everything's on, uh, today I will be speaking on red sunflower seed weevils, and just looking at the results that we had from our research in 2023. And I want to make a note that uh, we had a lot of work done, uh, not just on, you know, the folks on campus. Patrick Wagner also helped us out on the west side of the state. And then we've also been collaborating with North Dakota State on this project because red sunflower seed weevils don't just affect us. They're also an issue up in North Dakota. They always say, though, we have uh, the bigger issue. So let's get started. If you're unfamiliar, this is what a red sunflower seed weevil looks like. They're fairly small. A lot of times they kind of hide in the sunflowers, but they're an annual issue for sunflower production in South Dakota. Now, historically, we said that somewhere between 50 to 80 percent of the developing seeds uh, can be infested. So the achenes, in recent years, uh, especially in uh, 2022, we saw as much as 90 percent uh, 96 percent infestation somewhere in that range and part of that might just be due to the fact that in South Dakota we're seeing very large populations of the pest. The larvae feed on the developing seed but the catch is they don't feed on the entire seed so uh, one of the ways we tell the difference between red sunflower seed weevils and say banded sunflower moth is how much of the seed has actually been fed on. Uh, we manage red sunflower seed weevils with foliar insecticides that's really the best management strategy that we have, uh, maybe until recently, uh, if we get to the end of the talk, I'll have a few options, maybe one primarily, that might be an alternative to those foliar insecticides. Now, the problem with the red sunflower seed weevils, I mentioned, we have these huge populations in South Dakota. So the threshold in oil seeds is four to six weevils per head. And you'll notice I say we have 10 to 100 or a thousand, sorry, 10 to a thousand times over the threshold. So uh, we, we're just seeing huge populations in South Dakota and add on to that the fact that we also have been having a lot of reported field failures after insecticides are used. So what's the problem look like? Well, this is what it looks like when you're out scouting. You walk into a field and the first thing you see is that there are weevils covering the entire plant pretty much. And so you go, okay, that's a problem. And I have to remind everyone that we used to recommend using insect repellent to spray the face of the sunflower head to make sure that we are counting all of the weevils present so that we weren't missing thresholds. Well, we're past those days for now. We don't have to use the insect repellent anymore because we have so many weevils that just looking at the face of the flower. Uh, so same plant, but you can look at the back of the head, the face of the flower, and you'll say, okay, we're way over threshold. And a reminder, so for every weevil we see on the face here, imagine there's probably a few more that we can't see because they tend to crawl down between those flowerets. And so that's why we use the insect repellent. So imagine if we sprayed this, we'd probably see triple the, the weevils coming out of this face. And so we know that insecticides did work in the past because we could spray them and we'd find a lot of dead weevils out in the field. So what's been happening? Well, if we look at some data that my lab's been working on for the last few years, this is evaluating these chemicals in the lab. So we collected them from the field, brought them in and saw, put them in vials and saw how many survived. 
So we used to use this term reduced susceptibility because we didn't have a known susceptible population to compare to. So can't say they're resistant, so they have reduced susceptibility. And so in 2020, we saw that 25% of the locations that we tested survived, had issues for lambda cyhalothrin. We jumped to 2021, we had 71% of locations. Same trend for esfin valerate, we saw an increase in the number of locations. And zeta zypermethrin or warrior two, we saw a big increase. We were already over 50% of the locations having issues, jumped to 83. And I'll just run through. Lambda cyhalothrin is uh, most commonly would be warrior two. Esfin valerate, the most common product would be Asana XL. And zeta zypermethrin would be uh, Mustang. Mustang Max. So uh, one of the big catches is that in all of the years we've been doing the research, North Dakota's never had issues. They have no signs of reduced susceptibility or anything else. Uh, and so we look at 2021 versus 2022. Now we go from 71% uh, the fields having issues to 97 for the Warrior 2 and 46 to 90 for Esfin Valerate. So we had a big jump for Esfin Valerate or Asan XL. You'll notice that we dropped the Mustang Max, and the reason was it just it didn't look good in any of the years we tested it, so we already figured it was having issues. And again, North Dakota had no issues. This is a table showing resistance ratios, and those are calculated by looking at a data that we collect from fields that are having issues and compare that to fields that aren't having issues. So we have one uh, that we compared to, and so in 2021, uh, what we're looking for is numbers uh, that are less than 10. And so if they're less than 10, it means that they're not real resistant. If they're under five, it means they're susceptible. And so in 2021, the three locations we tested all look pretty resistant. Our West River Research Farm, so that's the one out by Sturges, uh, in the 2022 year, uh, Asan XL looked like it was maybe a little bit moderate. This was compared to our North Dakota data from our collaborators up there. So uh, they have such little issues, they even make uh, what eventually became our susceptible susceptible population look a little bit rough. Uh, but West River Research Farm does not have any issues uh, compared to the other two locations we looked at in 2022, we saw there were signs of resistance. So uh, that was a big thing for us though, this data right here, because we could stop saying reduce susceptibility we actually have resistance issues. So that was the whole point of all of that research we did. And so if we look at, uh, you know, the slide changed recently, but looking at the problem, we have 42 insecticides labeled for management. I need to up that to, I believe it's 47, uh, because I said this changed recently. And the reason it changed recently is because now chlorpyrifos is legal again for use. So uh, you won't find it. The old name would have been uh, chlor. Uh, for chlorpyrifos would have been Lorsban, uh, but that company is no longer producing the product. So there are five products, if I have my count right, uh, that are currently labeled in South Dakota for foliar use. Everything else that we currently have labeled has a pyrethroid active ingredient. And this is an issue because we've had field failure reports for pyrethroids starting in 2017. And if you notice, we've had one every year since then, or multiple. We had that reduced susceptibility. That's what we have to call it for 2020 and 2021. But we can now say we have resistance to Warrior 2 and uh, Asana XL. So those are active ingredients. And we still have these huge populations in South Dakota. And we just aren't uh, really getting away from those. And so here are the locations we collected from uh, in 2023. So can see Patrick collected some locations out west. We collected locations central, uh, actually got a little bit further east than we normally do, which was uh, kind of a surprise for us because it seems like the cutoff line for sunflowers the last few years has been right about here. Uh, so we did find a site a little bit further east. So we were thinking, well, maybe it won't be uh, as bad. What we do next after we collect thousands of weevils per field, we bring them back to the lab and we start putting them into vials after we let them rest for 24 hours. We don't want to stress them out too much. They just got knocked into buckets. So then we wait and then we put them into the vials. And the vials are treated with insecticides or acetone. Everything's mixed with acetone. So that's our untreated control. There's a lot of information on this slide, I know. And the big thing I want to point out is that the numbers that are highlighted here uh, for the dosage 
represent the 1x labeled rate. So the highest labeled rate, that's the 1x rate. And everything else is based on, so this would be 0.25 times the uh, labeled rate, and this is 4x times the labeled rate. And so we collected the weevils, we put 20 into vials after letting them rest, and then 24 hours later, we came back and determined how many were alive or dead. And North Dakota collected one location in 2023, we collected 10. And so here are the results from that study. And what I wanna point out is here's the chemicals that we tested. The LD50 represents the lethal dose that we tested based on the lethal, uh, the doses we tested, the lethal dose that would kill 50% of the individuals. The LD90 represents the lethal dose that would kill 90% of the individuals. And then reminder, this is the 1x rate. So what we want to see is having the LD50 at or below the 1x rate. And we'd like the LD90 to be at or below, uh, or sorry, we'd like the LD90 to be, you know, close to the 1x rate. So we're essentially so that we're killing uh, those individuals. And so when we look at North Dakota, we see that their LD50 and LD90s look wonderful. They're way below the 1x rate which means that they have very susceptible populations and that matches everything we visited about with them. They, they haven't had a lot of issues with insecticides working up North. Now let's get into South Dakota. So we tested two locations in Hyde County. And what we notice is our LD fifties are, you know, a little bit below the one X rate. So we probably are effectively with that labeled rate killing about 50% of the individuals, but we're not getting anywhere close to 90%. And so we're leaving a lot of weevils out in the field because we just aren't killing them. We jump to our second location and this is, uh, we aren't sure what happened here. It's a, it's the unicorn of South Dakota, that population we tested because I'll tell you right now, Delta gold looked terrible everywhere we tested it the Delta methanol active ingredient. And except for at our one hide location, it actually looked like that population is very, very susceptible to it and everywhere else it was not. But anywhere you see red means we have a problem. And so as we go Powder County, uh, we weren't killing very many individuals. Sully County, we weren't. The 8314 Junction uh, didn't look good when we look at the LD90s. And kind of the same thing for hand County, the Dakota Lakes Research Farm, where we sampled. And then we get to West River Research Farm. I did mention this is our now susceptible population. It looked like that population's responding very well. They die when you treat them with insecticides. Jump to Pennington County. And what we see is, so this is uh, a little bit further east. We see that we have some issues. And I like to point this one out. I mentioned Delta Gold didn't look very good. It would take 44,000, almost 44,500 times the 1x rate to kill 90% of the population uh, at, at this location. And so that means that we just couldn't put enough product out to kill them. And so then we look at Hawking County and again, everything, everything looks pretty rough. And so the other thing I, I point out when I talk about these LD90s and that we, we just aren't killing a lot of the individuals I mentioned we're having somewhere in the ballpark of thousands of weevils per head. So let's just say a thousand weevils are on a head. We're trying to get them below four weevils per head. And we can't kill 90% of the population, but say we kill, say, say you have a product that works really well and you're killing maybe somewhere in the, between 50. We'll look at uh, Bathroid XL here in Pennington. It worked pretty well, but we're not killing 90. So say we kill 70%. Well, we're still leaving well above threshold numbers out in the field. And so when you go and rescout, you're going to see that it doesn't look like it worked. And the reason for that is we're just not getting enough kill with our products. So the next thing we did was calculated those resistant ratios again. And so if it's less than five, we say it's susceptible. Five to 10, it's getting a little bit resistant. And then if it's greater than 10, it's highly resistant. We take our test population and divide it by a known susceptible population. So for 2023, it was test populations divided by West River Research Farm. And so when we start looking at resistance ratios, if it's in green, it means pretty susceptible. For Hyde County, Bathroid XL uh, at 
that location looked pretty good. Delta Gold at the Hyde County number two. And remember, I said that was a very unusual site uh, based on just every other location we tested. Looked like it was susceptible. But then when we jumped to pretty much everywhere else, uh, Delta Gold was high. Uh, the populations are highly resistant to Delta Gold. And that's pretty much the trend we saw with everything, but Delta Gold was the worst. And we don't know why, because to our knowledge, that active ingredient hasn't been used a lot. So one of the things we thought is maybe it's just a breakdown of that entire class of insecticides. Uh, because pretty much right here, there's a couple other products, because that 42 I told you about is actually a breakdown of, uh, if you look at the actual active ingredients, most of those are actually the Warrior 2, so the Lambda Cyhalothrin active ingredient. And they're just uh, the generics, essentially, based on that active ingredient. And then there's nothing else, though, uh, really with Delta Gold and Bathroid XL, uh, but it seems like there's just kind of a trend towards we're having some issues. But we'll keep going. The 8314 Junction, uh, the Asana XL looked pretty good there, but I went I went bank on that because everywhere else we've tested in the recent years uh, didn't look good. And so this might be another uh, just unusual population. And again, Delta Gold didn't look good there. Hand County, Delta Gold really didn't look good. And, uh, you know, nothing else did either. Dakota Lakes Research Farm again. Everything was resistant. And then the West River Research Farm, we actually compared that to North Dakota. North Dakota's numbers, though, are so perfect, uh, pretty much zeros across the board at all of the doses we give them, uh, that we couldn't really use it for anything else because our numbers just explode uh, even bigger than what they were. And uh, for South Dakota, we think that this is really our comparison right there because it's in the state. And it's still pretty susceptible. And we haven't sprayed insecticides there. So we're going to try to maintain that population as being susceptible. And then if we look at our other sites, Pennington County, we also had Delta Gold looks very bad there. It's, uh, resistance is definitely present as well as at Hawken, but everything else also. So we break this down, just looking at where we're at. We confirmed resistance to Asan XL at eight of our 10 locations, Warrior 2, and this is just in South Dakota, Warrior 2 at nine of the 10 locations, Bathroid XL at eight of 10, and Delta Gold at eight of 10. And what's that mean? Well, it means we have a major problem in South Dakota because ideally we wouldn't have any locations where we're having resistance present. And so, uh, you know, as we look, look forward, I think it's kind of an indicator that we need to really consider not using pyrethroids. Uh, because they just aren't working. I mentioned there's a couple other active ingredients still that we didn't test, but they're related to what we did test. Uh, you know, in terms, they're very closely related. So uh, based on what we saw, we, we wouldn't expect those to probably work well either. And so is it cross resistance? Well, it looks like it. And cross resistance just means that, say we developed it, the resistance towards Warrior II first, but everything within that class, the pyrethroid class of insecticides, which all of these are, it's all it's all going to work pretty similarly on the insect in terms of the target sites. And so if we have a breakdown of one active ingredient or maybe in two active ingredients, uh, it's more likely that we're going to just have an overall breakdown. And so it, it kind of looks like that's what we're having here. But one of the problems we have is we don't know uh, how much Bathroid XL and Delta Gold have been used in South Dakota. We know for a fact that Asan XL and Warrior 2 have been relied on fairly heavily uh, because they did work well. Uh, so we know these got used a lot, but we aren't sure about the other two active ingredients. And so now we're going to jump. So that was all in the lab. We also tested the field populations in the field. And so that's what we're going to talk about next. And so we had our insecticide evaluation. The plots were planted on June 14th. Uh, we also, we didn't spray them. We also planted an early uh, set of plots that were planted on May 8th. Uh, but I'll show you just the untreated for that, uh, just because it's kind of interesting. Plots are sprayed at a field average of R5.2. So that was August 17th for us out at Dakota Lakes. 10 heads per plot were hand harvested. And we went through, we just randomly selected heads from the center two rows, and then we looked at 
uh, a thousand or a thousand seeds per plot because we looked at a hundred seeds per head. And this this is a very tedious effort because you're looking for the exit holes for the weevils. And so on this graph, we have percent damage seeds. And uh, so it goes from zero to 100. And this is from when we look at each of those seeds. And so imagine this is just essentially out of a thousand seeds. But here's our untreated early. And so uh, nothing here was st statistically different from one another. But uh, what we do see is a trend where uh, Delta Gold didn't look great. But again, it was numerical differences, but uh, didn't look great. And based on all the stuff I showed you, that's not surprising. Uh, but we didn't see anything really in terms of percentage of damaged seeds drop below our untreated controls. But then when we look at our yield, uh, this is where things start to separate a little bit. So here's average yield in pounds per acre. Our untreated control that was planted early out yielded uh, pretty much everything else. Uh, and so that's we'll talk about it in a second, but that is a trend we're seeing a lot of evidence for. We look at our untreated control uh, that was the same timing for these when the uh, other products and everything was planned at the same time. We see that numerically it was a little bit lower than a few of our uh, products that were applied, but nothing was statistically different. So if you see a BC, uh, that means that everything uh, was related in terms of the statistics, and so nothing stood out. Uh, what was kind of surprising is our average yield for some of our products we know aren't working great was a little bit higher than some of the products numerically uh, that we are testing. And so something else, you know, last for the last few months I've been talking about, I saw some maybe possibilities of illegal applications, but good news is this in 2024, these applications won't be illegal. Uh, so I have a, some pretty good uh, evidence that this was a chlorpyrifos treated field. Uh, so uh, last year I said, you know, don't do that. It's illegal this year. It's legal. So uh, I will though note that with chlorpyrifos and if we get anything else that's uh, all insecticides are going to harm the pollinators, but uh, follow the labels, please, because they do tell you time of day that you can apply some of those products because of the effects they have on bees. And so, uh, you know, most of the stuff that's on this face of the plant is that's dead are weevils, but there's a bee here. Just a reminder that pollinators are most active typically between somewhere in the ballpark, like noon to noon to four, noon to five. So after that, and that was actually present on the emergency exemption label for Malathion. So that was present in 2023. I cannot say whether or not Malathion will be uh, given an exemption label again as we go into 2024. But one of the things is that right in the emergency exemption, it said that applications of the product had to be between 6 p.m. and 12 a.m. Uh, to reduce the effect on the pollinators. So what are we looking at uh, for 2024? Well, uh, one of the things that we're going to be seeing is that uh, probably don't want to use pyrethroids. Uh, none of them that we tested really look great. And one of the reminders is that when we test things in the lab, they always look like they're working better than when we test them in the field. And so if we're seeing issues in the lab, you're going to probably, you know, for sure see issues in the field and they're probably going to look worse out there than they did in the lab. Uh, in terms of just general recommendation, my recommendation is not to use pyrethroids as we head into 2024 for weevil management and sunflowers. They don't look good. And it seems like every time people use them, I get more calls about them not working. And the, the research shows us that that's not a surprise. There's a lot of evidence saying that they aren't going to be effective. Now, I know the last couple of years, our hands were tied because we didn't have anything else that was labeled. Uh, I have heard already that for chlorpyrifos, one of the big issues might be availability. And so I, I don't have the numbers for uh, how much is going to be available or what companies are going to be producing it. Uh, I just know that the label will be legal for use here in 2024. We will also, uh, Tom Gear with the Department of Agricultural and Natural Resources is working 
to get additional products labeled through the emergency exemption labeling with the EPA. And so uh, SDSU will keep you up to date with uh, where we where we see uh, what products and uh, hopefully those will end up getting labeled sooner than later so that uh, we have them for the entire duration of spraying here in the state. And then the big thing, I, I don't have slides because I think I'm just about out of time, but planting date. And so one of the big things that we can try is planting earlier. All of the evidence we have uh, in South Dakota that we've tested the last two years is the earlier you plant, the less damage you have from the red sunflower seed weevils. And the reason for that is your plants are going to be past the point uh, where the weevils, will, the females will lay eggs into those developing seeds. And so you don't get the damage. Now, the weevils will still be present in those fields. And I had a lot of calls about that last year, which is understandable. You go out and there's above threshold numbers, but the percent damage tends to be way lower if you plant early. And when I say plant early, you know, what, what are we looking at for dates? Well, somewhere between the first and third weeks of May seem to be the best. So uh, kind of that second week of May around the 15th seems to be our best bet. If you go much past that, uh, towards the end of May, looks like the damage starts to increase. When you get into June, we see this huge spike uh, in damaged seeds. And so that's probably why the yield looked better in our uh, early planted sunflowers for our spray trial as well. So I'd like to thank the National Sunflower Association for funding uh, the planting date research, the spray research, that assay research. South Dakota oil seeds has also been extremely supportive for all of our efforts on this problem. And so our big hopes is that as we move into the next couple of years, uh, we get some other solutions and figure out a way to knock those populations down so we don't continue to have these uh, just extremely large populations of red sunflower seed weevils in the state. So if you have any questions for me, the uh, best way to probably get a hold of me is either my office phone number or my email, which are both here. And I always let people know I need to, I, I keep forgetting to update this. So it's no longer Twitter, but the handle is still the same on the, I believe it's the X app. And so I typically don't use that much in the winter, but in the summer, I try to update with what insects we're seeing in the field if we're above threshold. And then if we produce any extension articles that are relevant, uh, say to a major pest, I toss those on there so that if you're on Twitter, uh, more than you're on our pest and crop newsletter, you can find those. That's also a, a shameless plug there. Uh, if you aren't already, please consider uh, subscribing to our pest and crop newsletter. It's through the extension website that gets sent out on a weekly basis during the summer uh, that has all of the articles that the extension agronomy group is producing. Uh, so a lot of important information, pest uh, management recommendations, as well as scouting. And so just uh, one of those great resources that we uh, produce to try to help everyone in the state. So that is all I have for today's talk. So I will go ahead and stop sharing and I'll turn things back over to you, Chris. All right. Uh, thank you, Adam. Um, <clears throat> there is one question here. If you have a, a few minutes, do you have time for a question, Adam? Yes, I do. So I see the question is, are there any predators that can be used for biological control of red sunflower seed weevils? Uh, the answer is there are some predators of the weevil. Uh, the catch is that they are parasitoid wasps. And from what we've seen, they are present in the field. They seem to uh, be active. And we also know that they are actually, in some cases, uh, infesting a lot of the larva, the problem is, is that by the time they do that, the larvae are still already in the plant. Seems like they're already feeding. And so most of the times when we find these parasitoid wasps, it's when they're actually in the bin. So they've been binned. And then, you know, in the spring, when the grain starts warming up again, uh, the wasps start to emerge. And so uh, we we need a lot of that activity. And I'm not extremely familiar with the biological, the life cycle and things with those wasps, but it seems like they're not perfect uh, for greatly reducing uh, the weevil populations. Uh, another question is, are the weevils going to damage another crop if sunflowers or acres are switched in rotation, especially in central South Dakota? That's a good question. 
Uh, no, they will not because sunflower weevils are uh, the, the only crop that they're really going to be found on are sunflowers. Now we can also find them on wild sunflowers, uh, but they, they do not infest the seeds of anything else to my knowledge. Uh, so we don't have anything really close to sunflowers uh, that you guys are growing out there. And so, uh, you know, jokingly, I know a researcher uh, recently was that was in the summer at our red sunflower seed weevil workshop was asked, what if we, you know, don't grow sunflowers? And he said that he thought it would take essentially a statewide effort uh, to not grow sunflowers to essentially just reduce those populations down. And so uh, that's, that's kind of where we're at there. Uh, but I, I don't think that's going to be the recommendation ever. And I'm hoping some of these other strategies work for us. Okay. That's Otherwise, all, that's all yeah. we have for, well, for you. Thanks Adam. everyone. Thank you once again. Uh, now we're going to turn it over to Pat Wagner, who is our uh, West River entomologist. So Pat, take it away. So um, Adam just got done talking about all of the, uh, you know, red sunflower seed weevil, uh, some of that research that we've been working on, um, really heavily focused on that one particular pest. Uh, for my talk, I'm going to be focusing on pretty much everything else. Uh, that will impact sunflowers. And um, I'm also going to be uh, focusing mostly on our, our DECTES uh, research that we've been, that we've done here this past year. Um, so again, uh, my name is Patrick Wagner. I'm the entomology field specialist uh, based out in Rapid City. And um, I did include uh, Dr. Varenhorst and uh, Phil Rosaboom on these slides as well, because they've both obviously been a part of that DECTES research that I'll be talking about at the end. So I wanted to start off by showing some uh, data here from our 2023 uh, sunflower survey through the National Sunflower Association. Uh, I was one of the, the surveyors on this here in South Dakota, and we went to um, I think it was over 50 different fields uh, in the state and checked for, you know, all your different issues with insects, weeds, diseases, and um, everything else. And when we're conducting this survey, our, our surveyors have, you know, the uh, an option there on our, our worksheets there to, to list the, the number one and the number two uh, limiting factors that they feel are, are really the most impactful there in, in that particular field that's being surveyed. So as we can see, um, the number one factor here in South Dakota for 2023 uh, was insects. Uh, and the other thing is that if they weren't the number one, uh, they were number two. So if there was something else that, that was determined to be the most limiting factor, uh, your insects were were not far behind there as your number two. Obviously, uh, plant spacing there was an issue, but um, in general, you can pretty much bet that insects are going to be a problem there um, for your sunflowers. So um, with that, I, I'm going to be talking about, uh, I think, about a half dozen other pests here that we'll go through that things that, that showed up here in this last survey. Um, most of these are, you know, something that's less than 10% uh, of an issue here, but definitely something worth worth mentioning that that shows up in in sunflowers along with our weevils and and then the dectes. So the first one here that I want to talk about is the sunflower seed maggot. Um, this is a, a small. Uh, fly pest here that we have these little flies kind of look like a, you know like a picture wing fly with the patterned wings and then the larvae are going to be just your typical uh, white maggots they're about three sixteenths of an inch long 
And this is what the injury is going to look like. You might not see those, the maggots or the flies, but you'll certainly walk into a field and you might see these big, you know, kind of growths on the, on the plants or on the, on the sunflower heads, they'll be really deformed. Um, so that's, it's from those, those maggots tunneling into the, the heads and causing those, those issues. And obviously that can result in your, um, you know, seed fertilization not being completed properly. Um, you know, maybe only a portion of that head is actually going to be viable. Uh, the larva, they're going to, as I mentioned, they'll feed within the head. Insecticides aren't really, they're not effective for this pest um, because it's really hard to get the flies to time it right. And then um, the larva are going to be in the head. So you can spray them all you want, but uh, they're going to be protected there within the sunflower head. And historically, it's really minimal damage um, with these guys too. But we did see some of this uh, in the past, this survey in this last year, uh, mostly showing up in kind of the field borders and stuff, um, but might be something that you'll notice. The next one is the sunflower midge. So this is another fly pest, uh, although much smaller. Uh, I mean, they're super tiny, like a little fungus net, basically. Um, the larvae are also very small, as you can imagine. And these guys will start showing up uh, in around July there is when they start emerging. And they're going to have kind of the opposite effect there on the heads where those seed maggots are going to cause those sort of bulbous growths on the heads. These guys are going to have, the heads will almost kind of cave in and look a little bit rotted. You'll have some, some different distorted growth with them. Uh, but this is also going to be an issue for, for your seed production. Again, same thing with this fly pest is that your damage is going to be really sporadic. Uh, a lot of these, there's more of an edge effect. Or, you know, you might have one section of the field that, that has some issues. The main thing with these guys is you want to avoid planting in any previously infested fields. Uh, you can do the, you know, the insecticides, again, aren't going to be much of an option because they're going to be feeding the larva will be in the head. But you can use uh, tolerant sunflower hybrids. Those are available um, that these guys won't won't affect those those sunflowers. So we're going to switch over to some lepidopteran pests, the uh, moths, and then I'll talk about a couple butterflies as well. Um, for the moths, we have a, a number of them. The the sunflower bud moth here is the first one. These are these sort of gray colored moths there with the they got these dark bands on them and then the larvae are going to be just that cream color with kind of a dark head capsule on them so we did see a number of these uh this past year as well again pretty sporadic but the deformed heads you'll have basically this hole in the middle of the head as you can see there uh just a whole section of it that's pretty much gone you can have some more severe um, deformities there, as you can see on that picture on the right. And with these, the, you know, there's not really economic, they're not a uh, economically significant pest because they, it's never really super widespread issues with these, but it's something that you certainly might see when you're out scouting your sunflowers. The next one is the banded sunflower moth. This one's a little bit more of an issue. Um, they're, Again, kind of these little little moths, kind of fuzzy. They got these ones are tan, and they'll have just a single dark band there on the wing, and then the larva will vary in color. There, some of them can be more that white or cream colored, some red, pink, and then you can have green as well. And you can see on the seeds here, that's where they're going to be causing their damage is feeding on the. You can see the, the nibbling on the seed coats. So the female moths are going to be laying their eggs on the bracts, and then uh, the larvae will make their way to the florets there and then tunnel into the seed. So with these guys, it's kind of interesting that, you know, you, you basically pick your poison. Um, we've have had evidence with that red sunflower seed weevil that it might be more in, advantageous to plant early. Um, but then if you're um, with 
some of these you might run into some of those these more of these lepidopteran pests if you are planting early because it's usually we say you know plant later for some of these because then you might miss that window when those moths are active and laying eggs um, you can use foliar insecticides here with these uh, banded sunflower moths as well um, and then another moth here is the sunflower head moth these are another small tan moth. They don't really have any of those dark bands on them though. And then the larva here are gonna be that dark color with the orange heads. And this is actually a migra migratory insect. So they uh, will show up a little bit maybe later than those other ones. Um, the larva here, they're gonna feed on anywhere from three to 12 seeds. They can cause uh, quite a bit of damage on the, the heads that that are infested with this pest. Uh, they'll tunnel through the seeds there and into the head tissue, and then you can have some of those secondary disease issues. They open up the plant for uh, some of the you know head rot and some of those diseases, which I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, later this week. Um, you can have some severe infestations there that you could have a 30 to 60 percent loss because these if these guys do get out of hand. Um, this is what it kind of looks like there if you're looking at a head. If you hear about um, you know, the, the heads looking trashy, uh, they, they, these moths or the, the caterpillars will produce this silken webbing and you'll look at the sunflower head and it's got all this webbing on it. And it kind of adds that trashy appearance because you'll have debris and things blowing around in the wind and, and get stuck to the head. So if you see your sunflower head kind of looking, have a trashy appearance, it's, it's probably from those sunflower head moths. Uh, so here's just the management recommendations that we do have for for this uh, for this insect. You want to start scouting there in early uh, to mid July. Look for the adults, those adult moths landing on the sunflower heads. The threshold here in general is one to two adults per uh, five plants at bloom. You can also use pheromone traps uh, to catch the the moths as well. And if you're capturing an average of four per day, that's uh, kind of your threshold level. For management, again, with this one too, is doing that late planting and try to do timely insecticide uh, applications. So you want to do it, um, you know, when the plants begin to bloom, you're going to be targeting the adults there to try to prevent that egg laying. And then you can also spray at full bloom um, when those, those caterpillars before they, you know, when they start feeding on the florets. So a couple more that I wanted to talk about here. These are uh, butterflies. The one is the thistle caterpillar. These are ones we don't don't see, you know, issues with every year. I actually didn't see any of these this past year, but it kind of depends on where you're at. Um, but thistle caterpillars, this is kind of what they look like. They got kind of this bristly appearance there. Um, they can be that brown and black color, and then the yellow lines there on the sides. And the main thing with these is they also will produce that webbing. However, it's not going to be on the sunflower heads, but it's going to be on the leaves. So what they'll actually do is they'll take that webbing and and they'll kind of connect a few leaves together and just pull them, pull them into kind of a little cavern, basically. They create this little nest um, and they'll just sit in there and just eat the inside um, and just defoliate those those section of the leaves that they've pulled together. So with the thistle caterpillar, it's actually the larva of the painted lady butterfly. I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with this one. If you've you've seen it flying around, it's a, a migratory butterfly, kind of similar, you know, in that migratory behavior to the monarch, but it only goes uh, into the southwestern US. Um, but with this with this butterfly, usually we have higher populations and more issues with those thistle caterpillars. Uh, if they have a, a really wet spring uh, in the, the desert southwest there, that'll really kind of ramp up their populations. So then you have when they migrate up to Canada, you'll have more of them coming through and then they'll they'll hit us kind of on their way back south again as well. So with this insect, it's. Uh, they call them the thistle caterpillar because they actually uh, do feed on thistle, particularly uh, Canada thistle. So that's great. Um, the issue is when there's a lot of them, 
and they kind of get done with the the Canada thistle and eventually they'll move into your adjacent sunflower and soybean fields as well. So it's generally a, a beneficial insect, but um, in high populations, they can cause some issues uh, in a couple of our, our crops here in South Dakota. I think the last time that we really saw a big boom of these, I think it was in 2019, uh, it was a really, really wet year. And I, I remember driving along the interstate and just hitting these things because they were just all over the place. But we haven't had a another boom in population here in a, in a few years. Another one that I like to focus on that's very similar to that thistle caterpillar is the checker spot caterpillar. So these ones are a little bit different. They don't have that webbing. They uh, congregate in these big groups, kind of moving army style across the leaves. The butterflies look a little bit different too. They have just purely that orange and black coloration and they're a little bit smaller. Um, but these two will be, uh, you know, have high populations during wet years. Uh, really, you know, 2019 was probably the worst that I've seen these. Uh, then we, you know, had a few years again that didn't really see much of them. Last year, at least West River, we did have quite a bit of moisture. Uh, we were out of the drought conditions there for, for the growing season. And I did see some of these showing up um, just to a small extent, but they were showing up uh, out at the the West River Research Farm there by Sturgis. Uh, so this photo was actually taken out, out at that same farm. This was, I think it was the first year that we planted sunflower out there, uh, but it was kind of a messy year. We had issues with weeds and then um, the these caterpillars just went absolutely gangbusters on those plants. So this was in August. They were just going crazy. And how they work is they'll they'll start at the, usually the top of the plant, the growing points. And you can see they'll just skeletonize the leaves and then they just drop down onto the next one, skeletonize that leaf. And then you can see here, they drop down to the lower leaves and they'll just kind of continue. And it was pretty widespread in the field um, in those plots that they were just getting torn apart by these guys. Again, it's more of a, a sporadic pest. It's not something that we have to deal with every single year, but when they cause problems, it can be quite an issue. Uh, for scouting, you wanna check, this is for uh, your thistle cater caterpillars and the checker spot. Um, you can scout 10 plants in five different areas of the field. As I mentioned with the other pests, you know, it, it can be uh, more of an edge effect with these and you could have just sections of the field that'll have problems. So that's why you need to go to different areas within the field. Because one, you know, you could just have to do some spot treating or something if they get bad in one area. You don't necessarily have to treat the entire field. The threshold here, too, is that 25% defoliation. And it's kind of hard to, to visualize that. It's actually quite a bit more defoliation than you would think. Uh, basically, if you're standing directly above that plant, uh, you know, we say that for soybean as well. If you're standing directly above the plant, you look down and you can see the soil uh, through all the holes in the plant that's probably at that 25% threshold. The other thing is we say, you know, avoid uh, doing any types of treatments if those caterpillars are greater than an inch and a quarter. Uh, usually that's pretty much their, their max size. They can maybe get up to about an inch and a half in length. So by that point in time, if they're that big, you're pretty much wasting your money there that they've already done all the damage that they're going to do. Um, it's more of a revenge application if you're, <laughs> if they're that big, uh, not really something that's going to make any difference uh, from an economic standpoint. All right. So for the rest of my time, I want to talk about the Decti stem borer and a uh, little bit of the, the small research project that we did on these here in, in 2023. So the Decti stem borer is also called the longhorn beetle. Uh, it's a whole group of, of beetles that, that have this type of appearance, that they have these really long antenna. Uh, and that's kind of, that's how they get their name there, that they have long horns, basically. Uh, the adults are, for these Decti stem borers, are five-eighths of an inch long. 
and they're going to be solid gray here with kind of some black markings. Uh, they're going to be, again, very long antenna that's going to be longer than than the body. So they're pretty, pretty characteristic of these guys. It's uh, pretty easy to spot. Uh, they don't really look like any other beetles that might be showing up there in your sunflowers. Uh, the larvae are going to be these little small kind of grubs there with they're going to be legless and they're going to have this accordion shape to them uh, and then cream colored there with kind of a dark head capsule. And I've been asked, you know, if this is a, a uh, invasive species or something, but no, they are, uh, they are native to North America. Typically they're more of an issue. The further South you go, I know they have quite a bit of issues historically and uh, down in Kansas, we always see that on the sunflower survey. They always have plenty of issues down there. And as you go further north into Canada, they're really uh, hardly any issue at all. But for Dectes, you're going to have your adults emerging. There's a, a pretty big window there between June and August. Um, it really makes that, you know, trying to treat with an insecticide or something is very difficult, if not impossible, um, just because of that long emergence time. The females, they're going to chew a hole in the in the epidermis of the petiole there, and then she'll lay her eggs. And the other interesting thing with these Dectes is that uh, the larvae are actually cannibals. So you're only going to have one of them is going to survive. So if you have multiple eggs, you know, laid on the same plant, they hatch out, they go into the stem, and then they'll basically duke it out. And uh, you only end up with one of those larvae per plant. Um, Adam also has some, some research going on East river. I'm not a part of it, but, uh, the, on these guys being kind of a minor pest of soybean, uh, here in South Dakota, I think it's more of an issue in the Southeast, but, uh, it might be something worth asking him if you're interested in that. Uh, just talking about the life cycle here real quick, just wanted to give a brief overview. So, um, with Dectes, the adults, they're going to emerge there after pupation and be looking for sunflowers um, or any of their alternative hosts, including uh, soybeans in some cases. Uh, after mating, the females are going to lay their eggs. And then they're, the, as I mentioned, those larvae are going to hatch and then tunnel into the, the stem there of the plant, uh, feed on the pith, and then they're going to work their way down to the base of the plant eventually uh, later in the season. So that's where they're going to overwinter, and that's where they cause our our issues here is when they're going to be girdling the base of that plant. And I'll talk about that here uh, in the upcoming slides. But um, the populations will, or, or sorry, pupation will then occur in the spring. They'll so they'll overwinter at the base of the plant, pupate, hatch the next year. So we only have one generation of these guys per year. So this is what it looks like here, uh, burrowing through a stem. Uh, so they'll be in the stock there. And then, as I mentioned, they'll girdle the base when they overwinter. And you can see uh, in this picture, uh, it might be kind of hard to, to see there, but there is a, a Dectes larva there in the middle. And you can see how, how big of an opening there that they can make uh, in those stems uh, that can cause quite a bit of issues. So. Uh, it's more of an issue if you have slender uh, slender stems, they're going to be able to girdle those plants a lot sooner, especially if it's a drought year. This is Dectes are more even more of a concern uh, because you'll have obviously just smaller plants in general. Some of those, those stems are going to be a lot slender and then you'll have lodging happening a lot earlier on. So the main thing I want to say is that that injury is is from the girdling uh, that is causing the the lodging. It's not the injury isn't from the, you know direct feeding on the the plant to cause yield loss. It's it's the lodging that happens because they're girdling the plants. All it takes is you know we live in South Dakota. It's you get some some gusty winds and that's all you need is a little bit of wind and it'll just snap those stalks off um, and you have all kinds of lodging in the field. So. As I mentioned, those thinner stems with these guys, they'll have they'll cut about a half inch radius there um, in the stalks. If you have thin stems, it's going to be more of an issue. If you have thicker stems there, then 
even they're going to cause that same amount of of girdling but it might be able to to keep that stock a little bit stronger and and prevent it from lodging so for our management recommendations uh as i mentioned foliar insecticides really aren't aren't a good option they're not effective because you're trying you you can't really control the the larva and you're trying to control the adults but with a you know two month emergence period, it's kind of chaotic trying to to time it, and you're certainly not going to get them all. Uh, tillage is one option too uh, to try to if you have uh, you know previous issues with with dectes, it can disrupt those overwintering uh, populations. Uh, management of weedy hosts. So this is another one. If you have a lot of cockleburs, giant ragweed, those are, uh, you know, those top weedy hosts that they have. If you can try to do some good weed management, that can bring your your populations down. Uh, if you have a, a major weed problem, I go by a field and they got lots of weeds, even in, you know, in the road ditches there around the field, they probably got a little bit of a dectes problem. Uh, crop rotations, that's another option. And then uh, with planting date two, uh, this is what we we wanted to kind of look a little bit more closer at uh, for, for what our, our strategies are. Again, because with the seed weevil, you know, we're saying you could try to plant earlier uh, to to try to combat those populations. But what is what is that effect going to have on Dectes? So this brings up our, our planting date study that we did with Dekti stem borer uh, in 2023. We had a couple locations that we did this at, at the Dakota Lakes Research Farm near Pier, and then at the West River Research Farm by Sturgis. So we had two different planting dates for this. We had the early planted plots there were around May 8th, and, and then the late planted plots were June 14th. That was at Dakota Lakes. I think we were pretty close on that too with with the rest West River uh, plots as well. But then we went into the fields and checked the plots and evaluated them for yield and then the percent infestation and percent lodging. So I'm gonna show a few uh, bar charts here that will uh, kind of display our, our results of, of what we found. So we have percent infestation and lodging here, and this was at Dakota Lakes. And you can see uh, it's pretty crazy that uh, the amount of, of Dectes that was Dectes issues that they had uh, there at Dakota Lakes. So the the yellow bars is the number or percentage of infested stems, which is you know between ninety and hundred percent there. Uh, worse, a little slightly worse there in the early, but really not a significant difference there between the two. And then lodging was the other thing. Uh, percent lodging was. Yeah, 50% there in the early, but not quite as bad there in the late. So looking at uh, West River, Dectes weren't as big of an issue, but they certainly were significant there. The early had, you know, close to that 60% of the stems had them. And then the lodging was um, also, um, you know, not great there for the early, but less than at Dakota Lakes, but definitely a comparable trend. Uh, and kind of this is as we expected there, the late wasn't quite so bad. So these these are, this is where it kind of gets interesting is when you look at the yields. So with Dakota Lakes, we had the early actually yielded better than the late, um, which was interesting. Uh, there is kind of a, put an asterisk next to that. I'll talk about that here in a second, uh, why this, this was probably the case. If we look at West River, this is kind of more of what we would expect there that our our yield was was less there in the early and and better in the late. Um, so it's kind of an an opposite trend there. Now the thing that I want to mention is at at Sturgis there we actually com we used a combine to harvest the sunflowers. So yeah, we definitely the the lodging. Uh, came into play there that we, uh, you know, if you had plants laying on the ground, things getting eaten up by animals and whatnot else, uh, you definitely had more yield loss from those lodged plants. At Dakota Lakes, uh, they actually 
did hand harvesting. So those really great yields there in the early uh, were likely that would be like a perfect situation uh, if you didn't have any, you know, any lodging that wasn't an issue. Uh, you just were managed to to harvest every single head there in the plot and it was perfect. That's what it could look like. But with lodging, we really see that impact at Sturgis there where we had quite a bit of a, a yield impact. So the impact here of planting date, kind of what we can gather from this study. Well, um, the infested stems were were really high in, in both the early and the late there at Dakota Lakes. Um, and then again, to a similar trend there at Sturgis, even though it wasn't quite as bad. Uh, the lodging was worse there in, in the early at both locations. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is that these plots were actually harvested at the same time. Uh, so that, you know, those early planted uh, sunflowers sat in the field a little bit longer and had more time for those those um, stalks to, to dry out and then lodge. And then the contrast in yields, as I mentioned, is most likely due to that harvesting method. So we had kind of a perfect situation there at Dakota Lakes. And then um, at the West River Farm, we had more of a, a realistic yield, I think, of what we would expect. So some considerations here for early planting. You want to assume that the Dectes infestations, uh, that you have higher Dectes infestation in your early planted sunflower. Uh, one option is obviously doing what I talked about, doing like a lower planting population. I usually see a lot of lodging in fields that if I go in that they're solid seeded. They usually have quite a bit of lodging issues. But if you have a lower planting population, you can have thicker stems and it's not so much of an issue. But I think the biggest thing is doing a prompt harvest there of those infested fields. So if you are planting early, it's important to harvest earlier. Um, otherwise, you'll end up like what we have here in this picture. This was at at uh, the West River Farm, one of our worst or our not so great plots there that uh, we had quite a bit of lodging. Um, but again, these were the early planting. And if we had harvested them earlier, uh, we probably would have had a lot better yields. But again, if you're planting early, make sure you harvest early uh, to to try to get them out of the field before they have a chance to lodge. So just real quick for funding sources, I wanted to thank the South Dakota Oil Seeds Council for funding uh, this research. And here's my contact information. I know I'm probably pushing time here, but if we have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer those. Pat, there are two questions. Um, one is where can you get the pheromone traps? Um, that's a good question in terms of where to, to source those. I, I don't have an answer off the top of my head, but, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and I'll, I can answer that question. I have to kind of do some research on that one, figure out where to get those. But yeah, good question. Definitely. The other is what were the pop plant populations at um, Dakota Lakes and, and the Western farms? Oh, that is also a good question. I do not have those numbers off the top of my head. Chris, do I you do. remember what we had at, at Sturgis? Yeah, that was at 20,000 at at the West River Farm. Okay. I don't remember what we had at Dakota Lakes, but I I think it was I think it was similar cuz we tried to do we tried to keep them pretty close. So we had we had bumped up our population populations for the sunflowers just because we felt like um we weren't getting really good emergence, so we we increased that a little bit. Otherwise, that concludes the uh, presentation for today. Again, <clears throat> join us tomorrow, please, for the, um, we'll be talking with Brent Reck from Purist Foods. Um, and then Thursday, we'll have the discussion on sunflower and, and pulse diseases. Yeah, so we did have a little bit of a, a scheduling switch around. So yeah, diseases are going to be on Thursday and and more of our pulse production tomorrow, like Chris said, yeah. It was, I think the schedule might say the opposite. <laughs> it does. Some late additions or, or changes to the schedule. Thanks everyone. Please join us tomorrow.
Have a good day.